So which is which? What makes GTLM different to GT3? What about GTD and GT3? I am to explain in this episode of Motorsport Explained. When it comes to peak endurance racing and stuff that isn't a prototype, you've got two choices, GTLM or GTD, but to avoid chopping and changing the names of the disciplines we're just going to call them by the catch-all terms GTE and GT3. But if you want to know, GTLM or GTE is GT Le Mans, and GT3, GTD is GT Daytona. Strip all the paint off the cars so they're all white and line all the GTEs next to the GT3s, and to the untrained eye you'd be forgiven for thinking they look the same. But there are subtle differences between the two, usually in the aero department. But the Porsche GTE has around 10 horsepower more than its GT3 counterpart, and will lap most circuits around 4 seconds a lap faster. For reference, in 2018 the Ford GT ran a 2.12.4 at Spa, while the fastest GT3 ran a 218.5. But 10 horsepower isn't worth 4 seconds a lap though, right? I mean I don't know, I'm no expert on the subject. I just drive them in the hope of being better than last in my class. There are so many factors to take in that should screw the statistics around. According to one website, the GTE car is 45 centimeters wider than the GT3, but the GT3 car without being nerfed for BOP is 23 kilos lighter. I will get to that contentious subject in a bit. So it's the aero then. And this is something I didn't know until doing this video that the rear tyre dimensions are the same between the two classes, but the front tyres of GTE are almost 3cm wider. That gives, in the words of Carl Pilkerton, grippage. So extra horsepower, aero and mechanical grip, that's where your performance difference lies. And while GTEs have to make do with just traction control, GT3s get ABS and traction control. This being that GT3 is intended more for the amateur semi-pro teams such as Team Parker Racing who want to run GTs but in a more cost effective way. Cost effective compared to most other motorsports on the planet at least. But there will be factory run teams on the grid as well and the field will be split between Pro, Pro-Am and Am depending on the lineup, and experience and, and all that stuff. There will be more amateur drivers in GT3 as well, and the last thing the series wants is a gentleman driver seeing a faster class in his mirror, panicking, booting it too hard out of Sunset Corner at Sebring, spinning and wiping out his Ferrari and a couple of Daytona prototypes that are fighting for the lead. DPI vs LMP1 Well I know what the next episode of this will be. There's also more control parts in GT3 while in GTE there are more OEM parts available, so GTE was intended more as a full factory operation and a shootout of the best manufacturers rather than GT3. But then BOP exists. So what is BOP and why do you keep hearing about it? Well BOP is balance of performance. If you watch the British touring cars or the Australian touring car stuff you might be familiar with the term parity. But parity just means that the series is on an even as can be playing field from the get go, such as control components like uprights, tyres, suspension, rear wings, chassis dimensions and so on. Balance of performance means the manufacturers build their cars and then the sports governing body sorts it all out afterwards. So BOP serves two purposes. The first is it makes sure that the grid is full of interesting supercar shapes, and second, it gives something for the drivers in the real and virtual world, and the fans, something to cry about. Let's face it, if there was no BOP in GT racing then the field would just be full of whatever the fastest car that season is, and then you end up with a one make series. And that's not interesting. But with BOP it means that the slower cars will get a leg up and the faster cars will be reeled in a bit to make sure that the whole field has a chance of competing. It also has to be said that BOP is applied per car as opposed to per team. BOP then makes it more on the drivers and teams to set up the car to do well, as opposed to one team spending money and going way faster than everybody else. So how does it work? It's pretty simple. Well, in theory anyway. You add weight, you reduce turbo pressure to auto horsepower, stuff like that. 
It's not as simple though as add 20 kilos to slow a car down by a second a lap because weight really just affects the car's responsiveness more than top speed or acceleration. Take some horses off and the car will feel better in corners but will be sluggish on the straights and horrible on acceleration. And most drivers will want to punch you in the face if you said to them that you've taken a bit of horsepower off the car. If it's a few kilos of ballast, they probably won't care. Five horsepower down at Bathurst or Spa or Le Mans will kill your performance. A bit of weight is a bit like carrying extra fuel. You can drive around that. But once BOP is applied, it's down to the drivers to adapt. For instance, the BTCC uses success ballast, and the top teams there will develop the cars to run the ballast. Just watch Ash Sutton or Colin Turkington with no ballast. It's like they're in a different league because that BMW and that Infinity are rapid anyway, but again, another topic for another day. BOP has a side effect. Sandbagging. What that means is a driver going slower than the car will actually go so you get some more ponies for the race. Because yes, that BOP can be done after qualifying. As Chris Harris once explained, at the Spa 24 one year, the top Mercedes team was going slower than the previous performances of that SLS AMG would have otherwise shown, and a lot of teams thought they were taking the piss. It turns out they were taking the piss and were dumped to the back of their category, along with some other penalties. But there is a great article done by Daily Sports Car that I'll link in the description for people to read, which has Seb Morris and Craig Dolby detailing how they go about doing a BOP change. GTE though is on the way out. It will be merged with GT3 to create GT3 Pro in IMSA in 2022, after just six GTE cars ran at the 2021 Daytona 24. As the name suggests, it will be pro drivers in GT3 cars. What this will do for the World Endurance Championship and the Le Mans 24 remains to be seen. It's probably going to end up being dead there too. Which is a shame, because GTE was the bit of Le Mans I cared about, and with Aston gone... Oh well. There's always cool that. So that's an overview of how GTE and GT3, or GTD and GTLM work, as well as explaining BOP. If you've enjoyed this video and or learned something, give the video a like, and for more from this series as I use sim racing to explain the real world of motorsport, click subscribe so you get all the latest. Massive thanks to the patrons of Patreon for their continued support, and if you wish to join them or join in the Discord stuff, then all you need to know is in the description box for you. So until next time, I've been Adam Ward, have a great day wherever you are in the world, and I'll see you all soon for another video. So until then, goodbye.